I can quickly share one piece if you can set up a screen share. Actually, I won't share it quite yet because I'll have to, to get ready. But, uh, but maybe we can just, just check in to see what conversation has been going on since our last uh, group conversation um, around the Gitmo presentation and, and what, what different pieces are people feeling like they, they want to present on. Uh, Marie, do you have any? any? Uh, sure. So um, I uh, jumped in and did a couple of things on the document. The first thing I did was to uh, go into more detail to talk about managing versus unmanaging. And I'm definitely looking for feedback to that to see if, um, you know, my perspectives align with other people's perspectives and how to make that richer. Uh, the second thing I did is I took a list that is somewhat overlapping of uh, uh, challenges that we had worked, been working on for the white paper, and I just kind of tossed that in there verbatim, so we just have more to look at. Uh, and, but the final thing I did was I created a draft format for the uh, presentation that included what we might do for uh, interactive um, uh, activities, and it listed out some time frames for things and whatnot. And the thing that I did, though, was I left the challenges that we would talk about kind of anonymous, le le numbered one through N, so that we could maybe discuss about which ones are the most interesting to include and, uh, and see if we even like that format. So I guess that, that for, from my perspective, there are two things we could do. One is to take a look at the format and say, yes, we like this, or no, this doesn't really work, or we, we can just change it a little bit or whatever. And the other one is to talk about, well, we've had a chance now to think about some what some of these challenges are and uh, which ones do we think are the most interesting to, to share with, with others. Very nice. That sounds great. Uh, I just shared, um, just to make sure, this is uh, still the, the um, workshop format that we're following, Yes, right? yep, that's it, yep. Cool, so maybe we can quickly skim through it uh, together and, and see um, if we're, we're on the same page in, in terms of those. So uh, the first one, introductions and current why, history and timeline. I think, uh, yeah, 10 minutes is plenty and I think um, everything here makes sense. Maybe we can start like specific, like not documents, maybe like keep this document and just e expand on uh, these individually, just so we have some, some more structure um, yep. to go through. Then, uh, well, uh, this is the format link. This makes sense. Um, yeah, did we want to include those at the end of this workshop, you will? Some have done, we do, some we don't. Include what? Include that one thing. I've got sort of bullets of takeaways. So sometimes, uh, especially when we uh, advertise a workshop, we say, here are the things that you will have <laughs> when you walk away from here, right? And sometimes we don't. So I don't know if we want to include those. That would be great. I, yeah. I, go ahead. I really like it. I think it might be ambitious for them to have a plan for applying on management techniques, but we can at least have it so that they have sort of... Daniel, uh, you're very loud. Oh, sorry. Thanks. <laughs> and, uh, sorry, I, I mean, uh, it, it's been a loud day. <laughs> um, we, can, we can have them go away with sort of a, a set of things in their toolkit around some of the specific techniques or a, or a starting place. Yeah. What, what I was basically... What I was basically going to have them do at the end is go into a pre-developed Google form where they answer those questions on what, they choose one technique and then go in the format and answer, and that, that's their quote, quote unquote. Yeah. That works. Um, okay, so maybe, so let's see, the, these are just uh, examples, right? Understand on managing. Yeah, yeah we, can totally, we can totally make them different. Understanding how and managing can be applied to more traditional development, have a plan for applying and management techniques to your own organization. Well, actually, I think those are, are pretty good. So unless someone has more to add, we can use those. Maybe, maybe I, um, hi everyone, it's Derek. Um, uh, maybe ju just one thing actually I want to add was to say that bring people some uh, context of saying, look, there is a pre and post COVID world um, and uh, maybe tell them why Corona Y could be actually a great example for post COVID world. Um, and, 
And I think, I think the unmanaged is a great tool to explain the workings and actually what to do, which is not too emotional. But I think at one point, it would be nice to have some kind of a common vision to say, look, what uh, we've been experiencing is maybe the premise of something different uh, that is not comparable to what happened before. So really say, look, this is a bridge to something new. And, and that could be maybe something that is not written at the outset, but that's maybe what someone should maybe get out of the workshop of saying, look, what you've just experienced is something new, different. And that's actually what we've just experienced and you've shared that experience. And that could be a solution to X, Y, Z going forward. So I think that would then actually also make Corona Y something quite unique because it would be some kind of a new organism emerging that could be uh, contributing to, to this post-COVID world in a different way than simply actually the tools that we're developing or you're developing. I think that could be maybe something which to keep in mind. Yeah, a great dichotomy here. And I think it, it will be even, it, we would benefit from a slide that is like uh, pre-COVID, post-COVID and like characteristics of, of those in terms of management including like remote work and fluidity of organizations and just the nature of on-demand workforce in general, because as we're seeing the, the career development is changing uh, rapidly and the actual, you know, internships, all kinds of uh, things. And, and people are starting to work a little bit like what looks like a very chaotic way, but also feels like a more natural way versus being, you know, locked into one company uh, all all the time. So there are definitely some some things to like extrapolate in different directions. No, and, and that feeling of fluidity, I think, is is, is important. Be it information exchanges and and just actually the way we look, the way we operate. Uh, we haven't known for some of us uh, at all. And uh, look, it's very open, generous, and whatever people feel they can contribute, they'll do. It might work, might not work. But I think the fluidity is quite, quite interesting and, and there's no finger pointing. It's like, look, we try our best. Yep, sounds good. If it's useful, it's something, actually, yeah, let's go, we'll finish off this first. So the next one is actually like, I guess, introducing the concept of fund management, right, Marie? Yeah, so there I was imagining covering some of the stuff that I'd actually filled in higher up. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I have, a, I have a little slideshow that we used, I used with, with our mastermind group to try to explain some of the unmanagement stuff. So if people want, I can go through kind of the highlights. That would be great. Oh, you cool. Do that? Sure. Okay. That. Is that that's, uh, coming through there? Okay, so basically um, what we did was we, just, we, we talked about playing with the management and kind of a basic introduction to what it was, starting by going through traditional organizational structures, you know, top-down bossy recruits for specific jobs to hire for specific tasks, moving from there to talking about um, the Stanford uh, research that was done on flash organizations and then using a paradigm uh, film production organizations where you make the job descriptions extremely rigid. You make it so that people are essentially gears that you can swap in and out as easily as you can. Um, and that that's, that's where the advantage of that kind of flash organization comes from. And then the structure map for what we're doing, which is closer to this, where it's something that is, that is very organic um, and where it is 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 bottom up organization, so that you're you're not hiring for specific roles. You know, all of the things that we already know about how that works. I then talk about um, an edge, you know, Corona is an edge case, not just as the initial case, but as one that is at the at the farthest extreme of what this is going to be like, where you have hundreds of people coming together to work on tight timelines to do production on something that stakes. Mm -hmm for this group that I was doing that we would do it differently for Gitma, but for this then I talked about our mastermind group as being the opposite kind of an edge case because it's a tiny group of people who, who know each other, are geographically centered, and whose mission is around support rather than around production. 
Then I talk about um, some, of, some of the core elements that are involved that, of course, are involved in normal organizations, but the way we think of them, shifting paradigm is, is helpful in terms of figuring out how are those going to look within the, the sort of more organic framing that's there. Signaling as the first one of those. So who we are individually, what our skills are, our availability, our goals, our ideas, current and forming projects, tasks, teams, etc. And then talk a little bit about the, the methods that we use for that, using Slack, daily recorded meetings, Trello, Google Docs, and that piece around, around um, uh, radical transparency to maximize the boost, the, sort of the, the access to that signal. Then we talk about decisions. I loved, Marie, your piece around, around the Buffalo voting. So I, I, I talk about that in there as, as, as an example of how that works in organic systems. Um, but how do we make decisions as a group? And how do we do that in a way that is light, that's democratic, but not in a simplistic majority rules kind of a way, but in something that is kind of somewhere on a spectrum between there and something like consensus. Um, and again, then talking about the same, the same tools and how we use those differently for those things. Because we also are using our Slack, our recorded meetings, our Google Docs for doing some of that decision making. Then talking about storage and memory. How are the different ways that, again, we're using Slack, the recorded meetings, Trello, and Docs in a different way to actually capture all the information about what's going on? Um, and then talking a bit about the procedures and the artificial intelligence tools, and even just little things like um, Zapier and things that we're using in order to tie things together into a dynamic storage and memory system. And then the, the final couple of pieces that I talk about in that part, uh, one being around cell differentiation. So how do we go from being an amorphous blob of volunteers into rather than there being preset teams differentiating out into discrete tasks, emergent roles. Um, one of the pieces I, I didn't cover in here in, in my blurb right now about it, but that I talked about and emphasized was that rather than flash organizations where depersonalization is one of the key parts where its efficiency comes from, that in, uh, in unmanagement, personalization is one of those key parts that actually understanding who the people are, what their skill sets are, what their passions are, help us understand where they can best plug in. And it's less about us plugging them into the right spot than us helping them understand and feel empowered to plug in where they want to. Um, finally then, ele the elements around, um, around production and talking about how, how that works. I, I, I don't have my notes right here for that piece, but, um, but yeah, how we then form into these teams and go through our sort of highly productive uh, work to get things done. Um, and the last piece there, I'm talking about outreach and about the ways that we as an organization then interface with other organizations, whether that is for, um, for promotion, whether that's finding partners, whether that is doing recruiting, and the fact that um, an unmanaged organization for this is extremely efficient because we don't have just the one point of contact. Um, everybody is able to take that on and is able to do that. And of course, in each of these places, um, for each of those elements, we can talk about here's some of the things we've learned and here's some of the places where we're at a loss or where we're stumbling uh, and, and we're looking for it. So that's, that's the basics for, for that little. Oh, that's awesome, Dan. Yeah, I, I think, love that. Uh, a couple of things that I think would be interesting to include is Uh, we lost you, Marie. On a cliffhanger, too. Yeah, I think it's connection issue. Oops. We can continue when, when Marie comes back in. Yeah. yeah. Um, I love the the slides. A lot of na nature in it. And um, I also really like, and it really resonates the, the differentiation, uh, the actual personalization uh, thing that, that you mentioned, because uh, for the past uh, six years, I've been building systems that are primarily like flash organizations where it doesn't matter uh, you know, who the person is as long as they fulfill the skill. And that's how I've uh, been able to, you know, create eight, 10 startups per year, just basically juggling many different freelancers that have very unique, specific skills. Like you need the API development, here you go. You need front end, here you go. And then just like shuffling pieces together and it changed. It changed, uh, especially as I learned how Corona Y operates, you know, from, from within. 
And I, I hope, uh, you know, different people that observed it also changed their management styles. But I actually restructured um, two of the startups that I'm still helping to, like, there was a crazy, like, crazy story. So basically, um, there are some people that I worked together for five years um, that I've never had a call or video call or audio call with. Uh, because I've been running so many uh, companies at the same time, it was almost impossible for me to have uh, personal relationships and actual calls with. And I was structuring all the work through Trello and Slack. So all asynchronous and all in the manner of, here's a task, very well described, and you either execute on it or you're not fit to execute on it. And then I have to find someone else to, to do that very depersonalized, very efficient in a way. But, um, you know, post-COVID, I actually got to know these people for the first time. I had, uh, you know, calls and actually met them uh, on Zoom uh, or whatever. But um, it, it changed, like the, the environment changed and I, had, I realized how much more power this collective intelligence has whenever it's personalized, whenever people really understand the unique aspects of each other and have this personal connection. So um, it changed for me and I, I'm pretty sure it changed for a lot of people in the world that have been running in the same way. And yeah, it's, it's definitely a thing. Well, I'd, I'd love that as a story, as a piece to be able to, to share there about how you're working around the line, observing how, how that's all going, is, is impacting your work on that entrepreneurial side. That seems like a valuable story to share. For sure. And I know my, my piece was very much, it was on the, the more abstract, quick, broad stroke piece. And my assumption is that what we might want to then do is if we have um, folks like, uh, you know, Yasun, if you were wanting to talk about some of the more like the, the nitty gritty in terms of, of uh, like how you're how you're doing that on the teams that you're working on those kind of pieces. Right? I'm interested in hearing kind of what the what the angle is that you're most interested in sharing. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Okay. So, <clears throat> what I think uh, most people uh, see at this uh, at this approach is that. Uh, Okay, all this uh, stuff we talk about is nice and sounds good, but frankly, it look, looks like a hobby to the outsider. So uh, what we need to, to prove is that it can be productive in the end. So <clears throat> I don't know if the what we have to, what's the best thing to to present uh, at a workshop like that, but uh, the most uh, the, the most important thing is that, that uh, it actually worked because, okay, we say it, it should work somehow like this, okay, but we now have a true, a true example. What I'm worried about is how we turn that into a, an actual workshop. Because, okay, there are a thousand people on a question, uh, would you be able to, to get this level of success without this organization? Probably not at such a short, a short time, but uh, what's, uh, what's our proof of concept? What's the main... Uh, What is there some, uh, like I don't want stack, to say com right? competitor, yeah. is there someone else working on the same thing on the traditional uh, hierarchical management that we can compare against? Do we have uh, the bar set somewhere and prove that we can go higher than that? Yeah, kind of metric and case study, some, right? Some kind of a, a baseline, I would say. Yeah. And incidentally, I, I feel like that's a perfect, I mean, exactly how you're saying it and what you're saying is a good segue. I think that it's great for us to give sort of, here's the, here's the cool stuff that's the broad stroke piece. And then to, to dive right into like, okay, that sounds neat, but how do you actually turn that into something that's, that's productive 
and, and then to move into that. And here's a crazy idea. Why not use Kaggle as an example? Because they're basically, you know, doing the exact same thing, except, you know, through a hierarchical model because, you know, they're Google and like you can see the differences and the speed and, you know, all things attached. And obviously we're biased because we're working with them and it's not like we, we shouldn't criticize them in any way or anything, but you can see uh, from the inside of Corona Y how much faster we're moving and how much more capable we are at organizing people and delivering things versus them actually having access to 100,000 machine learning engineers and not being able to get the same level of meaningful collaboration. There is a lot of individual collaboration, uh, individual participation, but not collaborate, col collaboration. Because the key difference between where Kaggle is successful and where Corona Y is successful, I believe, is the if the result can be measurable. If you see all successful projects on Kaggle have a baseline, they say do recommend uh, train a recommendation engine for movies or find the statistics for hospitals or yeah. things that you have a baseline and you say if you achieve a higher score you get ranked and the highest rank in the contestant gets the prize gets the job or even if you are on the top 10 it's very good for your uh, cv and you can probably use it professionally but this uh, this competition with uh, cord 19 there is no actual metric there is no open ended there is no leader, leader uh, leaderboard so it proved uh, that it cannot work in the kaggle uh, traditional approach uh, well, i sure. think you agree with I mean, you agree on that point, right is that we're collaborative not cooperative or, i mean not not competitive that's like that, that's like the whole the whole bottom line point and yes, <clears throat> you're exactly. looking at which is more um productive yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, I don't think that we are prepared to or would be able to find sufficiently similar circumstances to do if you want well clinical trials. But even if we could, I'm not sure that that's exactly the direction we would want to go. I think that this is more um, of an anthropological uh, kind of a uh, survey rather than a uh, uh, a clinical one, right? And that what we are doing is uh, one of, I believe that one of the things that is a benefit of this approach is that we are much more open to serendipity, but you can't measure the absence of something, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not like you're going to be hiding Easter eggs out there and say who found it because it's not, even that is not that predictable. It's all about how do things show up? And that is kind of subjective. And if it is subjective, it is. And so my goal is not to convince uh, business leaders that what, that what they have is a better machine. What I want to do is to convince business leaders that there are ways of doing things that will attract the absolute top talent in the world and allow them mm -hmm. to, contrib to contribute, not just within a little slice or the box we put them into, but to the full, their full capacity. And that's, th that's the message that I wanna do, and I don't wanna do it through clinical trials. It's like, if somebody can't hear that, there is literally no amount of evidence that I can generate that, that will create that. And if I try to prove it through simple productivity, then the, the system is too complex not to be gamed. So anyway, that's my opinion. And I think, I think it'd be interesting to take kind of a look, it's a little bit about like, cause, cause that's the side, the paradigm shift and the going to something that's fundamentally different is I think something that's huge. But I think that part of how we can, uh, can demonstrate, um, and this is kind of, you know, you know where Yasin is talking about, like how does it actually work on the ground? How do you, how do you actually produce something with that? Um, I'm just beginning to watch through Slava's hour long piece. Um, and it's, it's, it looks like it's amazing, especially in terms of having so many sets of different bullet points at showing like, okay, here's how, here's how you make something like this work. And here's some of the things that we're learning from it and such. And so I think that probably if we're able to do a little bit of both, especially for the crowd that we're gonna be kind of shooting for. Um, and this is actually very relevant because he's presenting to a group of uh, Europeans 
uh, like Dutch uh, people that are very, very like managery. Like it's actually like completely opposite way. Like, they're listening to him every time he talks about it and they're like, wait, what? Like it can't work. <laughs> like it shouldn't work. And they're amazed. But, you know, th that's, that's the reality. We, we can't really convince them, especially, you know, the people like Dutch people, but uh, we can show them that it's possible to some extent and show them why it works and the environment where it works. And I wonder, again, just thinking about that broad stroke side, if we start with something that is simply that, that clean demonstration of being able to say, so here was the mission, here was what we had as the starting point, and then here, however many weeks later, here's where we've ended up. And, and not just in terms of here's the specific, you know, some shots of the different things we've produced, but also things we, we've had these things produced, we have these functional teams, um, here are the different uh, contacts that we're actively developing and exploring, and here's our, our, a little bit of a roadmap of what we have. Um, can, you, can you map actually the nodes evolving over time? I, I think that would be amazing. You see, yeah. you just have some kind of visual to see actually how it organically actually function together. Because then actually it could be a good way to bridge and say, look, something similar, it won't be the same, but something that could apply in a different field, climate yeah. or whatever. Because that's where people actually would come home and say, but look, maybe the similar mindset, not the process, the mindset, actually, if yeah. done is the right way, could actually get to similar outcomes. And, and that's what's so complex. Yeah. I think uh, I really enjoyed what actually Mary said. It's really serendipity and look, it won't be the same path. But if you have the same rules yeah. or mindset, then maybe you'll get to the similar outcome. Yeah. Uh, maybe actually to, to go back on, on the comparison. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with a company called Equia in, um, in the US. Um, I've, I've just met actually the head of R&D and um, I just on the side mentioned Connor Y and uh, they were very intrigued. And um, they have actually um, using AI actually to do something similar, but from the industrial side. And uh, they would be actually ready at one point to just com compare notes. So maybe that could be an opportunity actually to say, look, what have you done actually the last two months? Um, and then compare actually where, where, where we are and where they are. Uh, it might be something different, complementary, whatever, but maybe it is something to consider. So IQVIA, I can put you that on the website. One of the, uh, oh, there, nice. Hmm, that's cool. One of the other since it's a workshop we're talking about and not a, not a strict uh, one way presentation. Um, one thing to do because we are talking we are really talking about the mindset, as you said, is to present it uh, as to lead the on the audience uh, thinking it's something that would that would fail. And okay, so now you see all this is chaotic and shouldn't work. You, you probably think it shouldn't work, but it worked. Just to make the, it's easier to do the paradigm shift if you purposely lead them the other way. Just yeah. as an idea for the presentation. I like that. And I mean, it could be interesting to, to again, depending on how many people we have, especially if we were able to, to get someone to throw out something that's a, that, that would be a particularly thorny problem to try to, to solve in a traditional way. And even through, through some, just like some simple survey stuff in it of saying like, you know, who has connections into organizations that might relate to it in this way or that way, being able to just map, okay, well, you know, just in this room, we've got 10 people who would be able to, you know, I mean, um, it, it's kind of a rough idea, but, but sort of do a little bit of an iterative process with the audience and ideally get them increasingly involved in coming up with what some of the content there would be. Um, especially if we had one of us in the presentation whose, whose function was essentially visual facilitation so that they were doing a graphical capture of what the, what the kind of the information and the structure that was coming out uh, in, that, in that portion uh, was. Is that making sense, what I'm saying there? Yeah. I wonder how we can actually like structure that. Yeah, you, have, you, you have actually this new new skill of drawing uh, comics based on the discussion of a group yeah. uh, to kind of uh, 
structure, the, the conceptual symbolism of what is being exchanged, but it's a specific skill. So you really need someone actually who knows how to do that. But that could be nice because then actually we'd have some kind of a symbolic logos, whatever, on the concepts. And I'm sure actually we could learn a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. Graphic facilitation is one of the is one of the areas where it's where it kind of is that. It'd be interesting if we were able to find a graphic facilitator for that. But even just something like FreeMind, using some kind of a mind mapping software that allows us to quickly link things together and sort of as things going pull things together. Yeah, we can use Miro. Has been great so far. But how how is this sounding? It's a rough shape. So again, we we present the corona why like here was the challenge and here was the, the fairly fast effective results that happened then we're talk of, from there we go into sort of a rough piece around on management again highlighting the fact that a lot of what it is is it's a mindset shift and going into this different into sort of this self-organizing piece and then we kind of jump from that broad stroke utopian vision of what it is to say well okay how does that actually play out it sounds like crazy talk how does that actually work in a production environment and then we dive into uh, kind of you know, more, more of what Yasin was talking about, maybe bringing in some of Slava's points in terms of the learnings that have happened around it, and then move from there into the more active workshop piece, where we're then trying to, to take a specific topic and work with the group to, to do something interesting with it. It's one idea. Maybe one, one good thing to, to point out is uh, as, a, as a measure of uh, why people really like to, to join Corona Y, uh, the fact that they put actual work there, actual workouts, that they take off something else or, or even le laser time or something. Is, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, you, Daniel, ha ha did an attempt to quantify at some point the, the amount of, uh, of workouts we can get from various people to, to commit on yeah, we, we, we have, and, and, and it's just a sample, but it's a sample that got us about 10, 10 full-time equivalent staff positions for three months worth of time. Uh, and then again, that was just from a fairly, that was from a specific call out rather than asking that for everyone. Yeah. Okay. But this, this is proof that uh, people actually want to do that because, yeah. okay, they get something back. It's satisfaction, it's uh, pride, uh, whatever, it's one values, but it's not a salary. So it's important to show that people find their own motivation to and have, have their own incentives and somehow satisfied. I like to, that uh, one. Yeah, 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 And I, I wonder if a mixture, it could be interesting with just within our Slack groups to do a little piece of, um, you know, we have our section on why people have come and what the motivation is. It would be interesting to see like, what are people getting out of it? Make a little channel where people could talk about like, what are the benefits that keep you here? Um, and I bet we could probably harvest all kinds of stuff that would be interesting both for the, conf for the, the conference, um, but would also be great marketing material for us to be using in terms of helping other people get involved. Yeah, it, actually I think we already have that was the motivation and purpose channel because people frequently mention things like, um, I want to help communities and learn stuff, and that's exactly that. But those are two basic needs that uh, you know most people uh, join right now to help and to learn something new, to become you know jump from a junior data scientist to a senior one, or jump from a student to an actual professional. And that career elevation is definitely a strong motivator. Actually, the the knowledge discovery concept that we've discussed uh, as a product previously is pretty much uh, pretty much applies here because you don't know what what we are looking for but the framework is here so that you can find it and find your way yeah. and come out a in, better person or whatever. in the way i have this internal joke that discovery engine is becoming a cult like just uh just being obsessed with the idea that there is something that can help you learn things you don't know exist. And it's such a powerful idea that you get really excited about it really fast. And yeah. I think actually a question that might arise is uh, how to say, okay, fine. Corona Y is not 
let's say, is here. Uh, first phase of COVID is behind us. So we kind of structured the data. We have some, let's say, outcome understanding. Could actually this in community um, address another challenge right. from this current community? Meaning, can you morph into addressing more than one challenge at one point? Uh, that, that would be interesting because at one point that would be also a way to define actually where you want to go. So uh, I would be interested to learn about that if I were actually in that, uh, in that conference. True, because yeah. I actually think that a lot of people that are joining Corona Y still are operating on the mindset that we're focused on the Skaggle competition. But then once they join, they'll learn that there is, you know, the... Uh, all kinds of projects. There is, you know, battling misinformation. There is Health Lens, which is open source a browser for X-ray images. There is, um, you know, explainable AI. There is Discovery Engine, and all of these things to help open science in a way. And that in itself, I think, e even though it's very overwhelming when you actually integrate into Corona Y and start learning, there is so much. It's, uh, it's definitely, I've seen people quitting just because there was so much stuff happening, but in a way it's also exciting. The people that can manage that like a lot are, are staying. Yeah, because I think it would rebound on what Daniel said and maybe at the end of the workshop, um, have a future focus. Meaning, okay, what could happen in, in a year time, 18 months, whatever, have maybe two or three scenarios to say, look, we don't know where we're going. We don't know where Kanawha is going, but this could be uh, some, some possibilities based on your knowledge and the rules of the game. This could be achievable, maybe, maybe not. Is it worth it, worth it not? But I think some kind of a forward-looking uh, energy would be, would be great to get out of the, of the workshop. I think even at the end, one thing that could be interesting to talk about is, is some of the other pieces, be they organizations that are interested in approaching things from a non-management position or other initiatives that may be looking to Corona Y in terms of how we've been doing things. Because there, there's the beginning of a little bit of that. And to just show that again, both the Corona Y itself is able to, to, to swivel and pivot into other, other uh, domains that we might be working in, but also to show that, that this unmanagement thing really is a thing. That it's something that isn't just a freak occurrence within Corona Y, but that, that Corona Y is kind of the, the the crucible in which it could be created, but then it can be duplicated. Maybe we should try finding an example on what uh, Derek said. I, I'm not sure we're confident enough to to try something live on the workshop and say let's suggest something and see how people respond. I'm not because unless we loaded. simulate that. What? Unless Sorry? we simulate that. Yeah, maybe Unless we uh, have we people can... already in the audience to respond with. <laughs> <laughs> like, because all of the experience that Slava had presenting his presentation or any time we get announcement of some stuff that we were doing within Corona Y, there is always this moment of like shock when people kind of, kind of lost it. Then you see kind of something happens and then in a couple of days later you're starting to see the discussion on that topic within you know like our slack threads mm -hmm. and some of the more kind of complex ideas it could take two three weeks actually like I literally we had like scenario when at some point you see a thread on a slack and people are like oh wait a second we could use our dataverse for this and this and that and then you kind of like Yes, guys, like when we just launched it, we're talking about this was the goal to launch that stuff. What do you think why we launched it? So there was, I mean, there is some frustration with this also, if you kind of from a managerial perspective, right? When you kind of like, come on, we, we want it. So all of this top to bottom approaches usually kind of creates this. But eventually our system works from this bottom up time when you kind of actually see that no matter what you do, like the seed you plant, it's actually growing. So the the nutritions are there in the in the ground. It's just about you know like all of these directions. Also, one of the interesting things, like only this week I started using like new terminology just to package it and for people to understand better. Like what is this for example, like discovery engine, not everybody understands what it is. But when I start using like okay, we're doing Netflix for data. 
like COVID-19 related data, I think people are more responsive to that because what is Netflix? It's a discovery engine for movies. You, sh you want to Netflix and chill and you don't know like what to watch. Netflix will tell you, here is a recommendation based on your prior you know, movies and your likes, dislikes. It can tell you what to watch next. And a similar thing, Corona Y acts as a platform like this. You show up and then if you know what you want to watch on Corona Y, you go and do it. But at some point then you kind of, you know, you already watched the movie, process the data set. The next step is like what to do next. And a good example is if you look at team forecasting and Isaac is, is a team leader there. So he joined Corona Y with his movie. It was like one of our first GitHub repo. Uh, it was like Cord 19 Q&A engine. But then he started doing like simply modeling for patient forecasting. But at some point he kind of like, you know what? It's not fun to do it alone. Let, and there are all, all other people who want to join him in the journey. And now we have a task time series from that. So in a set that kind of the guy who watched his own movie, then he Netflix and chilled a little bit, and then he found friends to Netflix and chill together, right? And they're all using like coronavirus that Netflix. I don't so know. I think maybe from this, we could kind of come up with this to, to kind of get this basis for everything we do together here. It's, it's kind of like this open science and chill environment in a sense, right? So again, I only start using this this week. That's why I don't have a lot of like confirmed, like well formulated thoughts on this. But I think this is something that could be definitely put on like one or two slides, just like this, this type of ideas. Yeah, I think the Netflix for data is very good analogy. I didn't even realize that we can use Netflix as a good like extrapolation of uh, or like simplification, the subset of discovery engine, because in a way it really is a discovery engine. You input things and you stumble upon things in there. And yeah, that, that's, that's the ideal analogy. The, the only problem that I see is when we use analogies, even like specific to the product, we automatically bring connotations that are attached to those products and like I mean Netflix to me is association of really like meaningless activity like disconnecting from the world versus connecting and collaborating because it's very um, like like you don't know but people but people this is again good point that like when you bring this uber for something that's for something there are like a lot of negative I mean baggage bring yeah. to it but there is a reason why elevator pitches usually kind of converges to this type of thing when something really big is, is happening like some disruption and for example like i definitely see that a lot of people are chilling from their corporate environment within corona white true they're kind of they're, they're escaping from like that reality but again it's again for majority of people, Netflix and chill, it's not meaningless. It's just simply like to escape from the world, watch a movie, recuperate, you know, like re revitalize themselves mentally and then go back to real world. The same thing we have within Corona Y. People join, then they usually, those super active members, they're not doing anything from scratch. They're bringing something from the real world. They just, again, it could be data set. It could be a model or something. And then just simply want to try in, a, in a, you know, other capacities. So maybe again, Netflix is like a passive activity, probably not the, the best analogy, just like the name is big and cool for data scientists. Netflix is one of the places to work. But otherwise, it's more of a like games or something, you know, like gaming environment. So people want to escape. Corporate games world. are actually very relevant because I actually think, and I've, I've, uh, have these ideas about how RPG and like multiple multiplayer w whatever games are very um, you know adaptable to this uh, environment because in a way like you go on quest but you don't really know what's in there like you don't know what like animals or whatever like things you fight you don't know what 
loot or like the things that drop out of uh, whatever creatures you stumbled upon. And yeah, I think there is a lot that we can take from games as, as mechanics. I would say even more than that. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, back about you know, five, six, seven years ago, I wrote this article for O'Reilly Radar on how the World of Warcraft is actually a workplace simulator and yeah. how, um, so, so I started, I started gaming about 10 years ago, my kids were little, uh, and I was, uh, you know, running big engineering organizations. And it turned out that the kinds of feelings and concerns and whatnot that people brought to World of Warcraft were just as strong and powerful as people bring to, can I get my next promotion? It's amazing. Yeah. And what, what, really, uh, what, what really struck me there is that my 11-year-old son learned to lead by influence as a, I don't know if you guys game, but as a tank, you lead by influence. So, so he had to have like all these people from different walks of life, all of whom were older than him, and who, some of whom had official authority and prickly personalities. And he had to get them to do the right thing or they wouldn't down the boss and win. And so I think that, and so it really is, uh, to some extent, an example of unmanagement in, in a management environment that where unmanagement is necessary in order to, or is in some situations necessary in order to produce a successful outcome. I love that. And I think, oh, go ahead. So just a quick thing with, since we're going with this wolf analogy, and Mary, like this example of tank, is a really good example how Corona Y at least early on worked. We literally, anything that was done was somebody just simply was like tanking, like was, so we had a bunch of people in this like square and wolf and the city and then somebody simply, we need to raid that specific boss and he simply like runs there, takes all of the yes. damage and then people just were following up like essentially this lead by example. So leadership by example works within Corona Y beautifully other types of leadership, not necessarily. And right. this tanking exactly like right now, I mean, right now we're shifting towards different influence, like by skill set, you know, like mages in, a, in, in the gaming environment for like more long range people tend to be like, oh, we need a long range vision, for example. But early on to kickstart everything, it was pure tanking. Like if somebody runs, boom. So maybe from this perspective, there could be interesting ideas how to portray what was happening within Corona Y. At first, it's just a mob of people like running around on the server. Then they start forming their teams and first teams are, tank is dominating that, but eventually we see the progress that, uh, you know, like long range type of personas are more, not well, I mean like they're kind of more valuable, like they, they start dominating the field. So very simple, like I definitely see a lot of, similarities and evolution of how communities evolve. With yeah. I love that. Oh, yeah. That's fabulous. And, and then it could be combined actually this um, mapping of the evolution of uh, Corona Y with some rules of the game evolution. So maybe I really like that idea. You see, you have maybe actually three steps. Initial steps is actually what actually Anton just described at the beginning. Um, and then you can see actually how the mapping evolved very organic, chaotic. And then actually clustering coming together and then try to say, okay, this type of additional rules emerge and maybe some others disappeared. Make it very simple, but I think that could be very insightful to see that evolution because people can, can easily relate to that. I really like that. Oh, one, of the, one of the things that came out of Marie in my last conversation um, was, was sort of the realization that part of the difference, you know, if you're doing a, a, a top-down organization and moving towards efficiency in it, most of what that involves is you have your different metrics and you try to maximize the degree to which you're hitting those metrics. And then what, what something with self-organization like this is, is it's you're sandwiched between competing pressures and it's a matter of recognizing the pressures and then figuring out how do you best balance, not eliminate any of them, but balance those pressures in a way that allows the right sort of stuff to happen on the inside, mixed with the surrender of the fact that you don't necessarily know what the right sort of stuff is going to be until it happens. But then part of, part of one way to map the evolution of the organization is to look at, you know, how did it start? What was the first sets of competing pressures that came about? Um, and then what were, the, what were the things that we figured out or that we tried or stumbled upon that allowed those ones to solve so that then the next set of competing pressures could emerge 
um, as, as sort of the challenge point. And I think we've had several different stages of that happen. Yeah, I think I three steps would be good. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, no. So I um, and it's it's funny because we're we're talking about gaming as the underlying architecture of all of these uh, patterns. And I I actually stopped gaming when I was uh, like uh, fourteen years old or something uh, because it, I I became bored of it. But I used to game a lot for and I was like making money with it and all kinds of things. And it definitely resonates. And the strategies that I employed in games are the same that I keep employing here in Corona Y in, in any of the, you know, my management or like startups and other environments. It's just, I, I operate in different environments, but the strategies are the same. And uh, it is also important, I think, to say that uh, <clears throat> the end result uh, is uh, pretty much uh, tied to the process that uh, you follow to reach it because we talk about self-organization. It's not that uh, we can get the end state and copy it elsewhere. You need to go through the, it, if we use the, the movie analogy once more, let's say I'm, I'm trying to get to the list of my top 10 favorite movies. How I choose one movie the next movie based on the previous one that I've seen and I end up having a, a top 10. Is the procedure I follow is very important on reaching the result. I, wouldn't have, I couldn't have someone tell me these are the 10 best movies in the world, watch them, and I would say yes, okay, I agree. So that's pretty much what people try to do, copying examples of various online communities, World of Warcraft and Second Life in some cases. At some point, uh, it was a big question. Why do people pay for uh, goods in Second Life? And uh, yeah. no, nobody, nobody. Many people could not understand it. It's, uh, it looked uh, ridiculous or maybe. But it's a process that people follow and they end up having the digital uh, asset or whatever I call it, I don't, I'm not very familiar with the terminology, the, the clothes of your second life uh, avatar as something of value. How do you end up having that? The same is with any yeah, or uh, self-organizing uh, community. Yeah. And it's actually like, and the reason I, uh, I mentioned like that I use the same strategies, I actually mean it like I was, I was like running bots in uh, in automating activities and games, and then I would collect the loot and I would sell it for actual like real world money, and like it's 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 the same thing. Oh, you were one of those gamers, Arta. One of those gamers. <laughs> <laughs> Did oh. you quit or you were well, banned? I'm... That's the question. He's definitely banned. <laughs> He's definitely banned for everything. <laughs> Admit, admittedly, a guy I game with a lot got banned from Di um, Diablo 3 because he was playing four characters simultaneously in one computer with like shell accounts to the point where they were like, he was farming the game so hard, they were like, and he streamed it and used to talk about it and he got banned from the entire game because of it. Because they were like, yeah, you are breaking, you are breaking the game, man. You shouldn't be able to do that. And it just side effect of his just ingenuity more than anything. <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah. Is, no, it's interesting. I think that to external world, we, we kind of look like we're breaking the game. Like we're, we're doing things that are like anomalies and we definitely look like outliers, but it's also like the process that we involve People are like, uh, you, you can't really do that. Like, you can't record all the meetings on on YouTube, and like, it, it's just it feels off. To, to yeah, I mean, you're talking to someone who used to build spreadsheets to play games more efficiently. So you know, I'm on my own level of weird too. <laughs> just different from your weird. <laughs> and I've been doing that since I was like 13. So yeah, same. Excel spreadsheets of trade routes for where you're gonna where you're gonna throw. Genuinely, your... genuinely totally. used to build right trade routes. <laughs> yes. tra trade routes for efficiency. I used to sit down and work out calculators of like how much can I take this tour before it's no yep. longer as efficient as it could be. 
you know, how much can I make money? How much can I experience? Which one's the mix? How, and I'd, and I'd, I had spreadsheets for work that out for me. And I'm like, when I used to talk to people in, in, like in the real world doing organizational stuff, she's like, just give me, give me a bit of time and I will literally spreadsheet you something to solve this problem. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and this ties, this ties so amazingly back into what Marie was saying around World of Warcraft and that I think that it's, it's not just that it's a great example of kind of that unmanagement piece, but that on the flip side, it's what are we tapping into in terms of the ways that we're empowering people, um, both in terms of the teams that they get to choose to be on and the work that they're doing that, that brings that same spirit. And again, that goes back to the whole, you know, Jane McGonigal side of things, reality is broken. Um, because anybody can choose to be on a team where they feel like they fit, they feel like they have something useful to contribute, they feel like they're contributing to something that's high stakes on a global scale. These are the things that draw most of us who are gamers into the games we play. And, and then I think one of the things that, that really struck me when Marie, when you were talking about, I feel whether it was a guild or what it was that you were kind of running or a league, but um, that so much of the, the feeling of elation that's in there, it isn't just about beating the big boss, it's about having a team that's tight and it has each Absolutely other. Absolutely doing it as a team. It's, it's exactly. 90% of the fun I find in games is I can, I can play so many. I've, I, I am pretty, I, for a long time, I quit, quit for the same reason that Arta did. I was like, I quit gaming for a number of years because it's a big time sink and it won't bring in anything good into my life anymore. And then I got back into it and, it's, and I realized it is literally my social life. And you know what? It's my social life and that's yeah. fine. I don't have to do a lot of it, but it's my social life. It's my, it's my little world where I can join someone and be my version of me and everyone else is as weird as I am. And that's fine. And I'm yeah. fine with that, but it is one of them things that like the only time I've ever had real fun in, with a game, the game is the vehicle to bring people together. It's not actually the thing that I'm bothered about. I could play, there's so yeah. many games I've played that I'm like, I don't enjoy this game very much, but I'm playing with like 10 people I love just shit talking with and having a laugh with and ripping on each other and trolling each other and being silly and winding each other up and helping each other out. It's like, sometimes we help each other. Sometimes we put minds in front of them and watch, wait until they walk into it and go, <laughs> yeah sorry I mean, well, i'm not yeah. really sorry <laughs> i mean and uh, honestly like this call feels like therapy but i i actually understand like some of the things that happened in my life and why they happened and gaming wasn't the only thing that i quit for the same uh reason i also quit music because i actually started like gaming music and like uh, obsess obsessively you know hack the the system and things like that. And then I realized that it's just not the best way to, you know, improve the quality of my life and all of the things. And I repositioned my energy to startups and entrepreneurship. So, yeah. I have to duck out because I have to head over to, uh, to EML for a thing, but this is an amazing conversation. I think if we can go back over this and a couple of the other conversations, we can probably harvest a bunch of stuff out into the document and start segmenting it into, so here's the themes going off of what, what Marie has built in terms of that structure, um, and then figure out who's gonna be talking about what and how do we kind of wanna do some of the handoffs and things. So y'all continue, uh, thanks, and I'll duck out now. <laughs> See All you right. And if, sure. if uh, you guys still have some time, I, I would like to go through the rest of the agenda, um, whoever has time. So on management, I, I think we uh, went very deep on that. But uh, then the challenges, part one. So <coughs> I think are, I missed a little bit of that because I was in a different, different call. But yeah. it's fine. I'll catch you up on the record time. Yep. So challenges, part one is basically oh, uh, the routing. Uh, what was the challenge? How it was addressed? And Tyler, you would be actually perfect to expand on this because you were the person routing, basically, uh, most of the time was the support of uh, me, Daniel, Anton, and a couple of other people. So maybe you could spend some time and um, you know extend on this uh, somewhere in the document. Um, again, not not too much, uh, not obsessively, but like one one page, uh, just high level description of how it happened and what were the challenges. That would be great. Um, exercise one, part one, solving remaining routing. Oh, so basically, and I think what would be important, and I think I mentioned it before is introducing the context, the fact that we're evolving as organization and the challenges that we had when 100 people were joining uh, per day are different than the challenges of, you know, uh, picking up, you know, 10 people per day uh, that we're experiencing right now. 
And who knows what, like if we actually push out some product in two, three weeks, we may experience this influx again. So yeah, I'm, I'm worried about the first time that we, um, that we push it, anything that like a big media bump of any kind that there will be another wave and I don't want to have to do that manually again. <laughs> Definitely don't. Want. But we've just been discussing some of the approaches that we're trying to break down. We've been talking about like differentiating between the different levels of interest from people. So like, like thinking of it as like people who want to sign up just for the newsletter, just to get a bit of an update on what's going on, just to have an idea. Then a, a second tier would be people who are interested in accessing our data and data systems, but not are interested in developing the tools or being involved in the production part of it. They're more interested in just um, accessing our data sets and telling us about the fact they're using our data sets. And then the third will be an active contributor on Slack, involved in a team, involved in things. And if we're trying to work out how to like understand the different interest levels that people have and to break them into separate processes and thinking about how we can deal with the people who are just like mildly interested versus the interested in one element versus the interested in producing or actually being actively involved in the community. And then once we find the people who are actively involved and wanting to be actively involved in the community, trying to understand them better as people. And we've been talking about maybe having like welcome meetings and maybe grouping people into like small cohorts. So, you know, five or 10 people have them in one call, get them to introduce each other, introduce themselves to the group, introduce what they're interested in, get them to all talk a little bit about what they're interested in, what their skills are, but not only what their skills are, but what what they join for and why. Because some people might be joining because they have skills and they want to use them. And other people are joining because they've got one set of skills, but they're actually interested in practicing or growing a different set of skills. You know, a biochemist that's actually more interested in learning more about data science and they've done a bit, but they want to know more. It's like the biochemist part of him, part of the person might be really useful for us, but they're more interested in actually learning about data data science. So let's not put them on biomedical stuff, but they want to be on something that's going to be keeping them engaged because being anything to do with volunteers, you have to assign them to things that they want to stick to doing. Yes, sometimes we have to do boring tasks, but some people enjoy mundane tasks and we need to find them people too, rather than putting someone on a mundane task that's not going to keep them motivated and they might do it for two weeks and then walk away because they're like, oh, well, I'm not getting what I want out of it. So it needs, it's, a, it's a very human balance. It needs to be, we need to very much get the under, to, to understand their intrinsic motivations of what, what's bringing them here and, and direct it to what can best use, utilize that motivation. And yeah, work out how, to, how we can group people and turn them into teams, make them join teams that they want to be on, you know, turn them into squads and teams and you know, teach them how to rally to a flag that they enjoy being, you know, wear a flag that they're proud of sort of thing but realize that they can have many if they want. Yeah, or at least finding a buddy. Like, you know, yeah. sometimes it literally takes me just connecting with someone on 15-minute call for them to feel that, you know, this is real and there is some connection and they can uh, stick and you yeah. provide some value. It's the human part of it's really important. Yeah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and make a point of fitting more of them in and we need to have more people who, like, who maybe even people who were interested in facilitating meetings and facilitating calls and getting more practice in, you know, doing that sort of stuff might be more interested in running welcome meetings because it's a practice, it's a skill, but they're also, they can also feel like they're contributing by actually welcoming people into the community. And that's a, something that's really important too, because we are a human group of people, no matter what we say, we might have a lot of AI with us, but we're still a big group of people. <laughs> yeah. True. Okay, so I feel there is plenty of stuff to formalize on this exercise, right, Marie? Um, maybe we'll. Yes, all... I think so. Yeah. I, it, and if, like, even if we can present this as one of the challenges and stick to it, I think that will be already huge and will be also beneficial to us and will also show all the participants the scope of the problems that we're dealing with in terms of optimizing people to tasks or optimizing people to groups and again like people don't know that these groups exist uh and our our task is to show them and to uh, lead them to those okay so challenges yeah and engaging them and yeah. actually solving the problem 
uh, that is real, that has real world implications, that's not theoretical, I think uh, makes, it's, it's gonna get, be better for giving them that experience of what is it like. Yeah, I agree. So challenges part two. Um, do, so do now we go through the next it? several challenges that are not routing, yeah. Okay. So basically you have one person take five to seven minutes to talk about each of the challenges that we, that we choose. Okay. Um, oh, so this and is then we abstract. Yeah. And then after we've done all that, we're like, okay, now let's bring everybody back together, report back on what your experience was during the challenge. Okay. Yeah, I think this is great. And then QA, maybe like QA uh, slash summary or like something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit of a summary. Um, I mean, I, I did a call recently with, um, weirdly enough, it was a group of facilitators talking about facilitating. And then they did a breakout session where we discussed like our points of view on the discussion that had happened earlier on and our experiences. And then we all came back together and we kind of summarized each other as a group. So like I talked about this and that person in my group talked about that. And then someone else thought, and they said, this group, we talked about this. And it was a, it's an interesting sort of what stuck and what, what actually, what people, you know, talked about. Weirdly enough, I talked about Corona Y a lot. Not, not being surprised. But, you know, <laughs> it's literally a massive part of my brain right now. And we were talking about facilitating and I'm like, literally every day I've been facilitating meetings in some form or another. It's all new to me, but you guys are professional yeah, and that's facilitators. A, that's really powerful. And so at the end of exercise one, exercise part two, the first thing we do is we ask people to report out and to do exactly what you said. And what's interesting about that is because we're in a virtual environment, everybody can do it at once. Right? We don't have to take turns talking. We can kind of glimpse through things. Various panel members can respond to, that, respond to them. And then we have them report out what they noticed about the process. What was it like doing things this way, right? And then we move into exercise two. And in exercise two, this is the part where we want them to think about their own organization and say, out of all of these issues, out of all the lessons learned that we've just come through, which one of these might be applied to your own organization? And then we send them to a Google form where they answer a bunch of questions and fill things out that kind of give them a little bit of a roadmap for how to take this new mindset back home. This is super cool. So wait, like how, how do we structure the Google form? Like do we ask questions or we present like this? things we summarize. So, so what, we're, what we're going to do is, we're go so in under each of the challenges, the way that was formatted, we talked about, we talk about the challenge, but we also talk about lessons learned. And we also talk a little bit about how it might apply to um, non-emergent uh, organizations. So by the time we're at exercise two, they've seen that. Um, and they will be able to just, uh, we will have a, uh, 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 a, a code, a VR code, QR code, sorry, a QR code and or a uh, short uh, URL that they can go to and that will take them to a Google form. In that form, they will uh, fill out their, um, their own thoughts and ideas and examples. And so it'll be like, which challenge are you interested in? What makes this hard in your organization? Uh, what are some things that could improve? that could uh, make that less difficult to implement? What are some of the outcomes you would expect in your organization if you did this? So they have something concrete to take home and share with their teams and have discussions about. An alternate way to do this is to just make uh, one room for, uh, for each challenge, for instance, and then they can kind of congregate and chat in there as they're filling them out. Should, should we maybe make it like voice uh, i mean um here's the thing in my experience was text and in forums in general like it's it's really hard and you have to commit uh to fill that out asynchronously and it flows much nicely if you just ask people and and it depends on how many people will have on workshop if we have 100 that may not be possible if we have 50 i think that would be cool to just like quickly go one by one and be like hey so uh introduce yourself and like where do you think uh you can apply this uh crazy idea right there will there's no way there's going to be enough time to do that okay 
I, I, because right, so let's say you take 30 seconds for each, that's 25 minutes for 50 people. And most people don't talk for 30 seconds. They, they, they want say, to go into their backstory any, and, and, any, and that kind anybody of stuff. Who, anybody who joins this kind of talk is probably going to be a talker. So you're going to get five minute discussions off every person. And but we'll be there but what we can do is let's say we set up breakout rooms. And I, am, I assume that within those breakout rooms, they are able to, combine, to have voice and text all happening at once, mm, yeah. which means that they can have a conversation and, they all, and each person has access to their own form, right? So as they're filling out their form or not filling out their form, whatever they want, they're also kind of seeing and hearing the conversation around them. Yeah. I think we, could, we could even split up and each of us could go into one of those rooms and uh, facilitate. Maybe one idea would be to, to simulate uh, the actual model we are suggesting and uh, do things as they happened in Corona, where I put them all in a, in a Slack channel, let's say, and to have them write a short uh, two or three sentences, what challenge they want to deal sure. with and what they think, and see mm -hmm. how they go into private rooms and uh, team up and uh, have them describe their experience. Because like that's that. the model we are promoting, right? So. Yeah. Right. All right. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Are we going to be able to spin up a spare Slack for this particular no, idea? That would, oh, that would be nice. Yeah. yeah. There are plenty of other things we can use as back channels. Actually, right? we may use the, that new thing that uh, me and Anton and other people found, the matrix which is the uh, open source alternative to Slack. And it's basically uh, a quick way to spun up uh, conversations and not be locked into any uh, vendor. Um, let me does it, does it have like email signups or is it just a case of you can just- It's a protocol. Sign. If you can, if so we can an, use any- If there's a anonymized version of it, if there's an anonymized version of it or like a way that you don't have to go through putting emails in, you just don't so, put people into it. <laughs> so this is a, a weird a name, but it's a protocol. And um, basically you can use voice or message. It's encrypted. It's, you can bridge it with Slack or any other things. And you can use any client uh, to do it. It's kind of like IRC chats on steroids in, in a way. And yeah, I, I actually, IRC. yeah, we can actually try it out because we've we've dreamed of finding a use case to try it out because it's not that easy to jump off slack uh in terms of kernel i and yeah, yeah. I, I vote to, to i'll send a link um, it's I, yeah, I mean if it, is it open source it is i if it's open source i am 110 percent on board with flipping to an open source system because it just it cements the idea that we are trying to use as much open source and open access and, and availability. Because if we use an entire open source system, someone else can go, I can build that for free. None of the things they, I don't have to worry about 6,000 pounds worth of Slack every month because it's $6 a person and I'm going to have 2,000 people in a month. I just don't, I don't need to think yep. about that. It's like, I can build a Slack equivalent for free. It's like, Yes, it means it, we're only promoting more of the open source. And we use Slack because someone built Slack and somebody had Slack, and that's where we started. I'm perfectly fine with moving. But we need to work out a, an appropriate time to move and also a move that's not going to lose loads of people. Yeah, I, I think so it, Go ahead. The only question I would have in terms of using it for the uh, presentation is, how long does it take to download and start to use? Is there a learning curve? Because if so, we may lose five minutes of our presentation time to people getting this downloaded. So they'll adjust. So I've used things called um, today's meet and things like that in lots of conferences that are trivially simple and it just allows people to communicate and it's a perfectly good back channel and not powerful at all, but good enough for that purpose. And the way I imagine uh, having this work is that we'll have some sort of a slide showing up as people are, uh, are waiting to come in and it will have um, <clears throat> the name of our presentation and stuff. But also, here's a link you need to go to. This link has everything you need to download, everything you need to look at. It has our slides. We're not going to make you wait till the end for the slides. If you want to jump ahead, jump ahead. <clears throat> uh, vote with your feet. Our, we believe in...
what's important to you kind of thing. Yeah, and from what I understand, it should be super easy. Like you can join in like less than five. Like we, we shouldn't even I mean, have that roadblock that we I have. Mean, if 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 you want an even easier one that is a one click go through don't even need to sign up process you can use discord discord as a chat system you could spin up a discord server which has chat chat channels yep. discord is discord is free it has a voice capability space within it but you don't and you could easily just build one for this purpose alone and then it's a link through a website and they can do it inside of they can do it inside a browser and honestly, I tried Discord and I joined some volunteer group, uh, um, Ukraine something, uh, and I got lost. Like it, it was like even though I'm I'm tech savvy and and I know Slack. You're not like, tech savvy, don't lie. <laughs> but it it was like <laughs> I I got confused like, and, and see like yeah, but that's no that got that got confusing because it's a really big complicated server with lots of things on it. If we spun up a server just for the people who were there. And they okay, don't have so to let's, sign try, uh, let's have hey the guys, guys, take a look at today's meet. <clears throat> it's a much, much it's, it's, it's not engineering sexy, but it is really simple. Uh, it's dead. Down from me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's today's meet has shut down. Thank you for <laughs> 10 wonderful years. Today's meet's gone. <laughs> okay, I withdraw my suggestion. <laughs> well, so let's do this. Um, me, Tyler, and Anta, and maybe Yasan will spend some time. And uh, you guys are also welcome to participate in it. We'll try to make a decision between Discord and Matrix, and we'll just test it. Like, we'll spun up new thing and simulate how it works and just uh, see how what is the most seamless way. And then we'll decide. Yeah, the good thing cool. with Discord is you literally don't even need an email account. You can just sign in. Just put a username in it. That's all you need. So and and you can it can be just built and forgotten. You can, you can delete the server after we're done with it. It's it's as easy as that. Yeah. So, I think it's the same thing with Matrix. Probably. I've just it's not long. Let's, let's try and see what uh, what works best. And you can build in the uh, the the voice for the subrooms there if you want yep. to, which is nice. Yep. Okay. So I think today's meeting was amazing. Uh, let's quickly agree on this uh, next one, maybe uh, early next week. What times work for, for everyone? Around the same time? Anything but Tuesday. Okay. Uh, Tuesday don't work for Daniel anyway, so. Oh yeah, right. So Wednesday, 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific, which is the same time as today. 9 p.m. for me. 9 p.m. is fine for me. More than All likely right. anyway. Sounds good. I think, so, I don't know, I've got that many, we, that many we webinars I go to. I've closed. Are we comfortable with the general outline that I threw yep. out there? With uh, yeah, Okay. Uh, I think that the next step I would like to do is to translate that outline into uh, uh, Google... Um, slides? Oh, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Google Slides. I'm going to finish in other uh, Google Senses. Put the, put the outline out there, and then we can start um, assigning slides to people to fill in. And Archer, do you do you think that your um, communications folks would be able to do some sort of formatting for us, add images, that kind of thing to yeah, make it beautiful? For sure, we have plenty of people. Awesome. To help. And is there a uh, with with whatever uh, mech, uh, technology we're using for the webinar? Is there a way to put up a background screen? Uh, it's Google Meet, so I've never seen that in Google Meet. I don't think probably, uh, probably because uh, oh, I know Google what we can do. Does. We can uh, route um, our personal camera or something. Uh, you you know how the Snapchat uh, hijacks your camera, and you can use filters. Uh, we can use something like that. Tyler, you you probably know okay. That. Yeah, my my so my so we, so my we webcam does it. Looking into background it. instead of you know my bedroom or whatever. Yeah. Well, can't guarantee that. My my room's still going to be my room. I can put a filler on it, but it always looks clunky and weird to me. I need to get better lighting for the next time I do it, though, because it's I like I like sitting in the dark, so it doesn't help when nobody can see me. <laughs> okay, cool. Sounds great, guys. I'm super excited, and it feels like we're we're getting something very interesting together. When when is this meeting? When is this going to be workshop? June twenty first. Yeah. June twenty first. 
So we got what? Two weeks, three days. Yeah. No pressure, guys. N not much. <laughs> I mean, not be funny, but we in two weeks we went from zero. To, I don't know what speed we were at when, but it was fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, good night, uh, good day for for different uh, time zones, and yeah, let's let's sync as synchronously and in, inside. The other thing we didn't do was identify what challenges we're interested in. I think we can have that conversation in Slack. Yeah, let's start. Well, okay. routing has to be there, and let's think right. about two ad adjunct like things. That Engage engagement is really good. I, I saw that from a couple of people. <laughs> yeah, awesome. really engagement. How many do we want to have? I would say four at the knowledge most. management. Knowledge oh, management is, a, is an absolute pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah. Decentralized um, knowledge management without a center is really a big pain in the ass to try and work mm -hmm. out because there is, no matter which way you spin it, you've got to have some management of a central repository, something to where people can go to. You know, you can't you can't expect it to be running around. Another one that I think is really, really unique is this notion of setting your goals bottom up. Yeah, yeah. it might be hard to define as a challenge. Maybe, yeah. I, I'm not sure how, like, how, how do you even formulate that? I thought, I thought Slava's statement earlier on, which was quite interesting about um, earlier on when he was talking, I, read, I, read, I watched his talk earlier on, and partway into it, he talks about, like, organizations he talks about corona wise an organization some interesting things he says but he talks about how like an organization like like the like open source things and um, requires something of a benevolent dictator to to and it re requires something centralized even if that centralization doesn't want to be the center so a ben benevolent so somebody who doesn't want to be the center but it is kind of helping doing some of the juggling and the deciding of things and I thought that was an interesting description of like a decentralized open source volunteer system like the building of Linux. And he talks about Linus Torvald. Linus, Linus Torvald is the benevolent dictator of Linux, but he is benevolent. He's not he's never been about it's never been about him. He's been about building a tool that's beyond and more than more than he can even build, but he's still kind of has one hand on the wheel. Because it still needs some respectful steering. to to an extent, so it's not like yeah, uh, it, yeah. which is a, but I enjoyed the fact that he described him as benevolent dictator because I'm like, yeah, he does have an hell of a lot of power, and he's not he's not got a lot of power because he wants power. He's got a lot of power because he built something from the start, and thus people look to him. But the side effect of people looking to him is it's respect, but it's not authoritarian. It's same as I am the boss, the, the Gabe guy, like. Yeah, yeah, evolves a similar sort of principle. It's like, but but never, but there's more money in there, so it's not quite the same. Because let's you be know fair, what Gabe, you make, you Gabe is exceptionally that, rich. <laughs> you make me think that maybe uh, uh, one of the topics should be culture, right? Which is mm. what is the mindset that the leadership has to have and that everyone has to have, kind of. And maybe another yeah. dimension is trust. Mm -hmm. I think trust transparency, is, oh, and tr absolutely. transparency and trust is fundamental to why we keep in talking about. Atta and I have discussed it more than once. Daniel and I have talked about. I've talked about an inclusive culture, but also a culture of openness, and not just openness in like transparency, but openness in like vulnerability. You've got to be, and you've got to open up to the fact that you might be wrong. We, Atta and I, are laughing and joking. It's like you we are normally wrong. We are nearly open, always wrong. Open to disruptions. Yeah. It's and open to, to something being different. Of, uh, uh, yeah, someone behavior. rather than rather than being like, my idea is the best idea, and it has to be the only idea, and everyone going okay begrudgingly. Someone, a, 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 somebody brand new to the organization could turn up and go, I've got this really good idea, and I think this is it, and they've got some power of will to them. It's like, don't know where he just came from or she just came from, but they're awesome. I'm going to help them, and it's that trust that you don't have to be all the answers, and you don't have to define everything and you can trust someone will turn up and help and it is a the kind of uh, the kind of uh, information that would get lost in a traditional hierarchy this mm -hmm. this kind of disruptive behavior that someone who comes with an idea would have to to escalate to the top and then decision being taken it would be probably lost in the bureaucracy one, uh, but we, we have one more important, of an aristocracy. yeah 
Well, one challenge, uh, since we're talking about challenges that I would say fit, is uh, what they usually describe in economics, uh, who will take out the garbage. There will always be one task in every mm -hmm. project, in every plan that you have that no one will want to take. Yeah, it's boring or make... dull or uninteresting or just grindy. You, yeah. how, how do you avoid ending up with uh, a thousand uh, incomplete projects, half-baked? Half Having a big enough why to make people push past it. <laughs> And it, it's like it's nobody, like video nobody games. likes putting it's the like rubbish out. In yeah. order yeah. to get the gear that you need to be able to defeat the boss, you gotta grind rep for weeks on end. And I think yeah. you've got to do stuff that's not that. fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The amount, that's one thing that's often misunderstood by gamers and about gamers is exactly that. Is some people, yes, they want the big things and the the glory, but some people enjoy the grind. Some people enjoy going to get something that's 1% better. Some people enjoy half a percent better. As long as it feels like they're getting something for it and they're doing it in an environment that's fun or enjoyable in some way, you'd be, well, I talk about this a lot with a lot of my gaming buddies when we stream. It's like the amount of times it's like, you've got to get the balance between interesting, fun and rewarding. It doesn't always have to be all of them, but it has to be some of them. It has to be interesting and rewarding, even if it's not fun, or it has to be very rewarding and interesting, but you, yeah, it's not always going to be fun. It's like, you're going to, you're always going to get like, it's like the, the, when people talk about, you can have, you can have something high quality, you can have it fast or you can have it cheap. Pick two. You can only ever have two of them. And it's the same with like motivation. You can either, you know, you can, um, there's probably lots of ex examples in, in normal organizations where people get paid well, but don't enjoy it. There's loads of people who get paid well and don't enjoy the work. Uh, you know, it's just the nature of everything. You can't, you can't, yeah, you've, you've got to accept the fact that not everything's going to be fun all the time. But if you can divide that little bit of crap that no one wants to do across enough people, you know, it's easy. Yeah, and it's actually like... Otherwise your house would be full of rubbish and you never empty a bin. <laughs> yeah, and the reason why I put up this quote about the uh, bulldozers is is the fact that, you know, in Corona Y, there is an example of that. It's not really that, hey, you know, we need to solve pandemic or like, hey, open science. Like when Slava joined, it wasn't his ideas of open infrastructure, open data. It was him like posting stuff every single day and, and showing like, hey, I just did Dataverse. Hey, I just did some other data set. Hey, I just did that. And people are like, oh, wow, this is exciting. I should pay attention to it. And it wasn't really the idea. It was a person behind it. Again, he's, he's a tank, but he's just like rushing towards it and aggressively pursuing it. And then things pick up like a week, two weeks after, people are like, oh, wow, this is amazing. And it is amazing. Yeah. And there's loads of other examples of that, that every team, every task team, when I got dug into it and we started to understand what they were doing just before first submission, I was like, how the hell have you put this together in this time when no one knew each other? How have you pulled that off? You yeah, did. the great example yeah. that Yasun can take uh, or talk more is Maya. Like, she's a tank. Like she was just she was just a and, boss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every yeah. single day. Yeah. 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 That's, that's oh, and that's, yeah. yeah. Another like thought about like benevolent dictator that Slava mentioned in his talk. If you guys want to research more, like dig into that direction, make sure not to like stop at benevolent dictator because that idea was like end of nineties. This is what spawned. Uh, Netscape open source their like browser. So Mozilla Foundation spawned out of those ideas. Linux, initially Linux kernel was following those ideas. But eventually what happened over like last few decades is Linux himself got tired of all of this kind of uh, being that benevolent dictator. So he dispersed that responsibility among the team. Uh, Mozilla went through huge cultural changes between their communities when there was like really strong like centralized leadership towards more like decentralized etc. So this idea of benevolent dictator is there but 
at this point in time, I think the, at least the open source community definitely knows that it's not about like leader or like a group of person. What Daniel, when he was showing his slides, right? Remember he had that uh, slide with, uh, what was it called? You know, you got what I'm saying, right? That, that group of people managing everything. Benevolent dictator these days is essentially the processes, exactly like this culture of the community that kind of synchronize the ideas between members, but then everybody goes in the same direction. And obviously there will be some tanks, some like major support things, etc. but there are no like that benevolent dictator becomes now like really this abstract, like God, you know, it's there, but everybody. Yeah. The, it um, the, the, the benevolent dictator has gone from being a, con a, a person to a concept or why. Yeah. But to a certain extent, you you I think he was talking about like the initial birth of a project requires a centralized spark, a self motivated, self interested, intrinsic value that someone's going to put some grind in before anyone else gets on board. Before anyone even steps foot in it, someone has to be pushing something forward. And Arta is a prime example of that. He started the process and he put a hell of a lot of energy in right at the beginning. And the more he put energy in, the more people went, he's putting shit loads of energy in. I want to help him do some of the energy he's putting into it. And that energy is then distributed amongst more people who want to, who see the value in the effort that's required and realize it's not natural and healthy for one person to carry it. And the human of us come into it. It's like, I want to help. I'll, I'll take one load. And then another person take, comes up and takes another shoulder under it. And then another, and then another. And it gets to the point where everyone is carrying the load. And it's, and it's easy when you've got 20 people doing it rather than just one. But someone has to, someone has to start trying to drag the big weight first. And it won't move fast and it won't move easily. But everyone else goes, or people will start to see that the, 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 the motivation and the level of drive required to go, I can see a problem and I can see a big bag of sand that needs going in that direction. And even though it's going to take me forever to do it by myself, I'm going to start anyway and hope people turn up. And that's exactly what I did. And oh, people turned up. And that's, that's the intrinsic unmanagement. That, that's, the, that's what defines the fact that um, it's a human instinct to try and I think it's a human instinct to try and help someone do something that's bigger than any bigger than they could do. And everyone, everyone sits here and goes, this is too big for me. Everyone sits in here and feels that everyone sits and goes, this is too complicated. This problem is too large, but enough people start to step forward and go, well, it's too large for me. And it's too large for the person who's doing it by himself right now but it's a little less too large for two of us. And then it's half as too large for four of us. And then four turns into eight and eight turns into 16 and 16 turns into 600 and 600 turns into 6,000. That's the way a movement grows. But someone has to be the idiot at the beginning who picks, who tries to move the mountain by himself. And, you know, and that, that's that would it. Fit, that would fit perfectly actually what we spoke earlier on about actually games and maybe the way they evolve and maybe have three steps to kind of describe the rules of the games. And initially, of course, the rules are linked to this benevolent, that the dictator has to show drive and define certain rules. But then over time, those rules could be more implicit to the group and then leading towards boundaries, limits, a bit like a soccer game, you know, you have a field. And then actually within that field, you have then certain rules to actually how to behave. And if those formalize, then actually the group will organize itself without the benevolent uh, dictator. So I think we had spoken early on of maybe defining three steps of evolution and then the rules of the game for each of those steps. And that could be a nice way maybe to get out this kind of benevolent dynamic moving towards a more self-organizing um, organism. And, and how critical uh, the initial conditions are, right? Yeah. And the people. It, it becomes some kind of tradition in the end. What Anton said that the process is the that the benevolent dictator is the process now. I, I would say it's not culture. It's uh, it's more like tradition. You do some things you may not understand exactly why, 
but you know it works and we do true. things th this way. Yeah, true. And it's critical to pass that knowledge properly, <laughs> even if it lacks the explanation, just like as a guide uh, to, to pass it. And then, uh, actually, what I think is interesting on top of that is how useful it is to have a meta conversation that explains the why for the tradition. So that as everybody working independently is making their own decisions, they're making those decisions uh, and applying the underlying principles well when they do that and when they break the tradition. Yeah, and that, that becomes like the, how do we define the code of conduct? How do we properly, you know, establish the principles? And, you know, uh, many people call these uh, different names, but the reason why I call it principles is because I'm a big fan of Ray Dalio and his book Principles. And it really, it sets the ground, the mental construct for how, like, you can create principles for your own life or your own organization. And those become that initial formula for the fractal to actually multiply and, and grow. Because if you have none, if there is no, uh, what's it called, attractor, the mathematical term, uh, like it, it doesn't really grow, it doesn't uh, multiply. Yeah, exactly. And I, I like the metaphor of emergence there where, you know, you have simple rules. So, so you're down to like four or five, that's all you get. But like you make one that's practice compassion for your for your personal life right or or whatever and then those apply in whatever whatever circumstances all right i think we've discussed it more than we can probably probably digest uh for the cu next couple of days so let's marinate on, on those things and yeah um uh, jump into life whenever we have ideas. Okay. All right, sounds good, guys. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. That is, guys.